Hey guys. <clears throat> All right, so today we're continuing on with Unit 10, and we're going to be looking at some of the power protest movements of the 1960s and the 1970s. Uh, we're going to talk about kind of where the civil rights movement, um, you know, kind of not ended up, that's not the right word, uh, you know, how the civil rights movement continued um, after the death of Dr. King in 1968, uh, as well as what other groups, what other subpopulations, what other minority groups in the United States are going to use the ideals of the civil rights movement from the 1950s and 60s as a jumping off point, as inspiration uh, to push forward for their own civil rights, for their own, uh, you know, sort of social well-being uh, as well. So let's uh, jump into this. Okay. <clears throat> so um, as we go through this, I want you to be thinking to yourself, what were some of the demands of the various power movements of the 60s and 70s? Um, obviously this says in groups, but you are probably not in a group right now. And if you are in a group right now, if you're watching this in my class um, because I'm absent, hey, hi, uh, good for you for being here? I don't know. We're not going to do the group exercise. Just in your head, I want you to be thinking about these kinds of things, using the information uh, that I'm presenting to you here. Uh, and then, uh, of course, you know, as you take notes, be thinking about this kind of thing. So the first group that we're going to look at, the first power group, is going to be the Black Power Group. Now we've talked about SNCC before, and I've mentioned the Black Panthers, but in the 1970s is when these organizations come together and really kind of show uh, what that what it means. Now, by 1965, African American civil rights leaders helped bring an end to segregation and an end to voting restrictions based on race. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 put forth by President Johnson, um, you know, kind of showed these things. Now, it was, of course, going to be a long, hard road ahead of uh, the civil rights leaders and the civil rights uh, advocates in order to enact those things, uh, as we talked about, uh, like with the Freedom Riders, for example. Uh, but, you know, the, it is a step, one of many, uh, for solving the, 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 the issue that was in place, you know, solving the, the racist laws that were in place. Now, after MLK's death in 1968, the civil rights movement turned from nonviolence uh, to, to embracing African culture and black pride. Uh, now, what this implies, I do want to specify, this implies that embracing black culture and having black pride going from nonviolence to this implies that this is a violent thing. But I want to specify that is absolutely not the case. Not the case at all. The black power movement was not inherently a violent movement. Um, embracing black culture and embracing black pride is by no means a violent activity, not at all. Uh, what it means is to garner a self-identity, uh, you know, to be able to develop what it means to be black in the United States um, as it pertains to being black in the United States, not what it means to be black in the United States as it pertains to what it means to not be white, because that that was already the case. The 1950s and 60s, though that kind of issue was 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 tackled. Um, one of the other ways it was done was by creating economic opportunities through black nationalism um, in black communities and black cities, um, cities with high, uh, higher than average black populations. Um, there would be pushes among the communities to patronize black owned businesses to kind of keep them afloat. Um, militant action as well to protect African Americans. The black power uh, movement was headed by, excuse me, uh, Stokely Carmichael, who again uh, would lead SNCC, but he would later change his name to uh, uh, Kwame Ture, and of course the Black Panther movement. Uh, with specific regard to the uh, militant action, the Black Panther movement is going to really showcase that. Um, along with the kind of action for the Black Power Movement, uh, this is from the 1968 Olympics, and this is a huge deal. In first place here uh, is... Uh, there's new bells, so that's going to be a thing. Anyway, um, this is uh, uh, Tommy Johnson, and this is uh, John Carlos, and... Uh, sorry, Tommy Smith, excuse me, Tommy Johnson. Um, this is Tommy Smith uh, and John Carlos... And uh, these guys were um, sprinters. They were runners uh, during the Olympics. And uh, you can see that after making the podium finish, they were doing the Black Power salute while the national anthem for the United States was playing. This was a huge, huge deal. Today, one of the biggest deals is, you know, like when 
uh, when athletes will protest, um, you know, the, the treatment of black folks in the United States today by kneeling during a professional sporting event, you know, football or basketball or whatever, um, this is kind of the birth of that idea. Tommy Smith uh, and John Carlos are also each wearing a black leather glove um, to symbolize uh, strength and, and, and black pride. Um, and uh, John Carlos, or sorry, uh, yeah, John Carlos um, has unzipped his, uh, his training jacket um, to show solidarity with the working class. Um, this was not received very well by many people, by many Americans. Uh, there were some very, as you could probably imagine, 1968, some very heavily negative uh, words, I guess is the best thing to put it. Heavily negative words and uh, heavily negative um, press coverage of these two protesters. Uh, it was still important, nonetheless. Uh, so the next movement we're going to look at is the Yellow Power Movement, the Asian American Movement. Um, this is, uh, you know, kind of one of the other ones. This predominantly, this is going to be on the west coast of the United States because it has a higher than average um, Asian American population. And the Yellow Power Movement, um, like I said, really goes back very far. Uh, you know, one of the things we talked about in unit like two or three in this class was the Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, racism against um, Asian Americans and Chinese Americans specifically has been prominent in the United States for decades, for more than a hundred years. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and uh, this is especially poignant now because I'm recording this um, on just a couple days after uh, there was a, uh, a shooting. Uh, a man shot uh, several, shot and killed several uh, Asian American women um, because of his own racist uh, issues. I don't even know how to classify it other than just saying the dude was racist and he shot. He's purposefully, purposefully sought out and murdered um, Asian American women. So all this is to say, of course, that Asian Americans... <laughs> Asian Americans faced discrimination in the United States with the Chinese Exclusion Act, Japanese internment camps during World War II, which we've talked about, and uh, anti-Asian attitudes due to the war in Vietnam, as you can probably imagine. So, yeah, here's a... Uh, uh, I'm not going to read that because it contains a, a racial slur, but this is a sign that was uh, shown at the beginning of a, of a neighborhood. Pan-Asian groups gained Asian American studies programs in college... Oops, sorry. Pan-Asian groups gained Asian American studies programs in colleges, health services in Asian communities, and reparations for interned Japanese Americans. And the next movement we're going to look at is the Brown Power Movement, Chicanos, Cesar Chavez, uh, and the United Farm Workers Movement. Um, this is uh, with uh, Hispanics uh, and, and Latinos uh, across the country, although it's going to center mostly around uh, people who identify uh, as part of Chicano culture, which is mostly going to be Mexican-American. Now, Mexican-American groups work to improve the lives of, of Chicanos. Viva la Raza is one of their, uh, one of, was one of the rallying cries, it is one of the rallying cries, which basically means, uh, you know, long live the culture, you know, it's kind of to protect uh, Hispanic Chicano uh, culture. The heritage, embracing Mexican heritage, or La Raza, um, and they fought for voter registration, poverty reforms, and bilingual education programs. One of the big problems um, that Mexican-American uh, children faced in American schools was that there were not the same um, helpful avenues for bilingual education and for learning English as a second language uh, like there are today. And so as a result, uh, brown children, as they were referred to, uh, did very poorly in schools. Mexican-American groups worked to improve the lives of Chicanos. Uh, Cesar Chavez organized the United Farm Workers uh, Union to help gain better pay, union recognition, and better working conditions for farm laborers because this was an industry that was pretty unregulated, which means that the people who owned the farms, um, or the people who owned the companies who owned the farms, could really, really heavily exploit the workers uh, and pay them very little and not provide them with any sort of... Uh, you know, safety regulation or, you know, anything like that. So Cesar Chavez really helped to um, kind of protect the lives and the livelihood of the uh, farm workers 
uh, across the American South and Southwest. The next movement, uh, power protest movement, is going to be Rainbow Power, the Gay Liberation Movement, uh, or the Gay Liberation Front, the GLF in some cases. Anyway, uh, the Gay Liberation Movement started in 1969 after the police, after a police raid at the Stonewall Inn led to riots in New York City. The Stonewall Inn uh, was a popular uh, inn and, uh, to a lesser extent, bar, uh, where folks of the LGBTQ plus community would go to, uh, you know, have a safe place to be themselves uh, because in 1969 it was still kind of a dangerous thing to be anything other than heteronormative uh, publicly. So uh, the gay liberation movement started as a response to the fact that the police uh, raided this in kind of uh, with no real reason to. The Gay Liberation Front, or the GLF, was formed to bring an end to discrimination against homosexuals. Uh, the GLF emphasized gay pride encouraged, and encouraged people to come out of the closet. This is when gay pride parades um, start to become more of a thing uh, in different parts of the country, usually starting in larger cities and then peppering into other parts of the, of, of the nation. Uh, this is a picture from the parade of 1970. So, yeah. Uh, then the next one we get to is the Red Power Movement, the Native American Movement, or the American Indian Movement. Uh, there are some very interesting stories and some really crazy uh, stories that I don't have time to go through uh, in this video, but I heavily encourage you guys to look through them and to kind of look up uh, you know, what was happening with the American Indian Movement. In the 1960s, uh, Native Americans had the lowest income, the highest unemployment rate, the shortest life expectancy of any group of Americans that were documented in the entire nation. Uh, and that is, of course, in no doubt uh, because of the way that the Native Americans have been treated since the uh, 1800s when, uh, you know, Manifest Destiny was a thing. Moving from, uh, from east to west and uh, American settlers colonizing the land that the Native Americans used to occupy. Uh, so after they had been corralled, in some cases literally, uh, and sequestered to Indian reservations, the Indian groups began demanding tribal autonomy and the return of lands taken by broken treaties with Indian tribes. In 1969, a group of 78 Native Americans seized the Alcatraz Island in San Francisco. Alcatraz Island, if you are unfamiliar, uh, is a prison. That's what this is. You're seeing it right here in this picture, uh, which has an extremely low resolution. Looks like it was taken with a potato. Uh, but this is the island of Alcatraz in San Francisco, uh, and it is a prison. And a group of Native Americans seized the island in order to, not to take it for any real reason, but rather just to take it to gain notoriety for their movement. In 1973, 200 armed Indians took control of Wounded Knee in South Dakota, the site of the 1890 massacre against uh, Native American Indians. Uh, so on this map real quick, I'm going to go through this, okay? In yellow, we have land that used to, uh, first off, everything, this is a map of the contiguous United States, the United States uh, with the exception of Hawaii and Alaska, which is unfortunate uh, to leave those out. We'll talk about why in a minute. But uh, everything in color here, which is the entire map of the United States, used to be occupied by Native American tribes of some kind. Land lost by Native Americans before 1775 is shown here in yellow. Land lost between 1775 and 1864 is shown in green. Land lost between 1865 and 1894 is shown in purple. Land that is retained by Native Americans is shown in orange, which is to say that these lands that are in orange here currently are uh, Native American uh, or I guess Indian reservations, what they're referred to as, as today. And the dark green areas are land that has actually been returned to Native Americans, which you can see there are really not very many. There's a little bit in Oklahoma, and some in the Dakotas, and, and some of the uh, northern Midwest states. The next one we're going to look at is pink power, the women's movement. I'm sorry, those pictures went by very quickly. Uh, so this is a uh, there. This is Betty Friedan. She is women need constitutional equality. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the equal rights movement. Uh, so. Okay, that's not right. Uh, anyway, so we're going to talk about the Equal Rights Movement. Um, the Pink Power Movement, uh, the, the the feminist movement, modern American feminist movement, really is what it's referred to as, um, 
is uh, was led by Betty Friedan. Betty Friedan uh, began the modern women's movement by publishing the book The Feminine Mystique in 1963. Uh, this is this is the book. Uh, feminists drew attention to sexual discrimination and unequal pay for women. Working women in percent of labor force is what's shown in this graph here. Um, and about 25% of the uh, of the labor force, 26%, uh, I suppose that's probably 30%, uh, of the American labor force was women. Uh, but by the year 2000, it's nearly 50% of, of the labor force. Um, and the median incomes for working men and women in 1950, uh, men would make uh, 20, uh, sorry, 2,570 dollars a year on average, um, whereas women would make less than a thousand dollars a year on average. By the year 2000, that number had jumped to about 33 and a half thousand dollars for men, but only about 25 and a half thousand dollars for women. Uh, there is a definite wage gap between. Uh, men and women. Uh, unequal pay is a very much a thing. Uh, Betty Friedan co-founded the National Organization of Women, otherwise known as NOW, uh, to advocate for women uh, with a good deal of success, to be honest with you. Uh, feminists demanded equal rights, an equal rights amendment to ban sexism in the same way that in 1964, an equal rights, or a, well, effectively what was an equal rights amendment, uh, was put in place in the form of the Civil Rights Act. Um, what the um, what the uh, feminist movement, the Pink Power movement, did with uh, Betty Friedan at the head was demand an equal rights movement, an ERA, to ban sexism and to ban discrimination um, on the basis of gender. The ERA was never adopted. Uh, the states could not agree that uh, discrimination against people based on their gender is a bad thing. Uh, it was defeated in the 1970s by conservatives and anti-ERA women. The leader of the anti-ERA movement was Phyllis Schlafly, uh, who believed that women were protected by the Civil Rights Act. So that the ERA is not necessary, it takes it a step too far, and it doesn't matter. So the states that ratified the ERA are the states that are in green on this map. Texas, hey, cool, good job. Uh, and the states that did not ratify the ERA are the ones shown in brown, tan, beige, I don't know, whatever the color is, the not green color. But the women's movement did have success. Even though that the ERA did not get passed, the women's movement did have success. In 1973, women gained abortion rights in the Supreme Court case Roe v. Wade. Congress passed Title IX, uh, or sorry, that's uh, Title VII, to protect women from sexual harassment in the workplace uh, as well as educational facilities. Congress passed Title IX uh, that outlawed sexual discrimination in education programs. Uh, it says, no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefit of, or be subjected to discrimination under any education. Uh, I'm going to move myself out of the way so I can read this. Under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. And there you have it. And the last one we're going to look at, actually I'm not sure if this is the last one or not. The next one, whatever, that we're going to look at is called the Green Power Movement, the Environmental Movement. Um... The uh, EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, is uh, established here uh, in the 1970s under the um, presidency of Richard Nixon. And Earth Day is one of the things that comes out of this movement. It's celebrated each year on April 22nd, uh, which is coming up pretty soon, actually. Uh, so come celebrate nature where you live on Earth Day. Now, in 1962, a biologist named Rachel Carson published a book called The Silent Spring, which exposed the dangers of pesticides on the environment. By 1970, the government passed clean air and water laws and created the Endangered Species Act and formed the Environmental Protection Agency, all as kind of a response to this. DDT is a chemical uh, that is used in uh, pesticides, and uh, with the use of the food chain, you guys, I'm going to move again out of the way, uh, with the use of the food chain you guys remember learning about when you were a kid, you know, you've got tiny microscopic life, and then the little fish eat the little microscopic life, the big fish eat the little fish, the birds eat the big fish, and so on and so forth. You go up the food chain, uh, and so the DDT concentration increases a lot as you go up further and further in the food chain. So because there are pesticides that go and infect, uh, you know, the microscopic uh, life that is serves as kind of the bottom level of the food chain, it is 
affecting in no small number the top levels of the food chain, and this is going to be a problem if nothing is done about it. Thankfully, the EPA passed clean air and clean water laws that help to curb this. All right. So uh, that's all I've got for you today uh, with the power protest movements. Uh, join me next time when we talk about the new left and the counterculture. Uh, we're going to talk about politics. We're going to talk about the hippie movement. We're going to talk about, uh, you know, who was a hippie, what is a hippie, and why was a hippie. Uh, and kind of what are the things that they stood for, what are the things they stood against, uh, and how they were perceived by the non-hippies in the United States, and kind of the clashes that, that happened culturally because of that, and kind of where uh, politics are going to lead uh, after the 1960s and 70s. It's going to be great. It's going to be so much fun. Um, so... You know, as always, smash that like button. I'm not proud of that. <laughs>